Welcome to Real Crime NYC, where you'll hear real New York City crime stories told by real New York City cops. Join Chris, Bill, and I for the third and final episode of the case we call Vanished in Brooklyn, about an eight-year-old boy who vanished from a Borough Park Brooklyn street on his first day walking home from school alone. This story might not be for everybody. We'll be discussing the murder and dismemberment of a child and the crime scene and forensic procedures involved. In the first two episodes, we learned of the boy's disappearance and how the Orthodox Jewish community teamed up with the NYPD in a massive search that was, in effect, a race against time. We followed the highs and lows as the detectives do what detectives do. They found video of the lost boy talking to a man with a car. They tracked that car to upstate New York, of all things, to a wedding, and then track it back to Brooklyn. The car's owner is identified, and bingo, he's the guy in the video. You find that man, and you find your boy. There's still a glimmer of hope that this will turn out like the vast majority of missing kid cases, with mother and child joyfully reunited. In this case, it was not to be. You see, we located the man at his home in Borough Park, Brooklyn. And nothing could prepare the detectives for what they would find there. They found the boy, but not all of them. Chris, why don't we pick up where we left off in episode two at the apartment? Yeah, Pat. So at this point, the investigators enter the suspect's apartment. They briefly speak with the suspect. The suspect gives motions, uh, eye motions to the to the kitchen area uh, where the uh, the investigators walk inside. They observe blood on the side of the refrigerator. Fearing the boy may be inside, they open up the door and they uh, see a black bag. When they touch the black bag, it was apparent they could feel there was a feet inside that bag. And they knew immediately that the boy was uh, no longer living. They freeze the location. They set off all the bells and whistles. They make all their notifications. They uh, remove the suspect from the, from the apartment. They continue searching to find out what the suspect's recent moves were prior to that day. Uh, they wound up tracking down video that led them to 20th Street, uh, where they have uh, the suspect's vehicle on video uh, driving down 20th Street and 4th Avenue, uh, backing up 20th Street and putting a piece of luggage and a black bag in a dumpster. So at this point, we have two crime scenes. We have the dumpster area. And we have the scene itself where the, the feet are recovered in. It was a real gruesome interior crime scene in the apartment. They wanted to get search warrants for the for the apartment, and they uh, they started processing the the scene uh, as, a, as a homicide scene. So at this point, we have feet that were found in the freezer. We have a torso that was found in the dumpster, and we have various evidence, physical and forensic evidence, that a homicide took place inside the apartment. We have a cutting board that's saturated with blood that was located inside the refrigerator. We have three large knives saturated with blood inside the refrigerator. And we have uh, multiple pieces of uh, bloody fingerprints on the refrigerator and various items like uh, blood-soaked mattresses and uh, other blood evidence that's spread throughout the whole apartment. What was interesting was when they find that suitcase inside the garbage bin on 20th Street in Sunset Park, he wraps the legs again, just like he did the feet. He wraps the legs in separate bags, and then he puts the torso, arms, and legs in another individual bag. So there's three bags inside this suitcase with the rest of this boy's body. But at this point in time, you have all this evidence. You have this three-story home with a basement, 21 total rooms. You have three different crime scenes. So you have the house, you have the garbage bin, and you also have the car that has to be processed by crime scene. So it's time to regroup. You have detectives working three straight days. They're living off of coffee from the squad room and Dunkin' Donuts. You have the case detective working with the district attorney to process the perp and also to apply for search warrants. You have crime scene that will execute the search warrants. You got the pathologist and the forensic anthropologist piecing the boy's body back together at the morgue. So you want a fresh set of detectives. You want a fresh set of eyes to work the two scenes and to work the vehicle to see are there any other victims. 
some of the things that were recovered required the expertise of not only just crime scene members, but also the police lab and the latent print section. In the latent print section, they have the ability to go to the scene and they could find patent blood prints. And that's what they actually found at these uh, scenes. And then you also have the latent print development unit and you have criminalists from the police lab along with the OCME liaison unit. And they'll come up with a game plan how to collect all this evidence and preserve it for the uh, trial. So you're going to bring cadaver dogs there. You're going to have ESU there. But very interesting. I'm standing outside that crime scene and I look across the street and I see an elementary school. It was stunning. This guy lives across the street from an elementary school. And some of the evidence that we're finding within his house raised our level of concern that there might be additional victims. Yeah, but we, we found things like children's toys, small stuffed animals, uh, drum sets, children's clothing, young girls' underwear and bras, pictures of young boys, things that the average normal human being would not have, toy handcuffs, broken handcuffs. The list really goes on and on. Uh, and when you're dealing with a situation like this, you're automatically thinking there's got to be a victim number two or victim number three somewhere that no one ever no one ever suspected this person of committing that crime. He had dismembered inflatable dolls. I mean, he, he dismembered parts of the inflatable doll. I mean, that goes in line with what he did to this little boy. One of the concerning things for me was this young girl's dress, and it had what looked like blood on it. So he has all these child things. He's got pictures of children. He's got dismembered inflatable dolls. He's got handcuffs in there. I mean, he's got some really concerning things that makes you say, has he done this before? Yeah, he's got rubber sex toys. It brings really a, a crazy angle to it. You got children, you got sex, you got dismemberment. It, it really makes for a uh, you know a Saturday Night Horror movie. This is all the makings of, of the worst that you could possibly walk into. And then you have a manuscript, and it's entitled Surfing the Net to Kill You. And it's about a man who follows a woman and eventually kills her. I mean, these are all the signs of a, a psychopath. These are all the signs of somebody who mentally is challenged. Everybody's a little gut punched based on the fact that we couldn't save this boy. But at this point, we have crime scenes and there's his job still to do. So we have to put that aside. And everybody at the scene now is thinking, wow, has he done this before? And if he has, where's the evidence? So. We're going to do some things at this point, uh, like check the basement for graves, check the backyard for graves, maybe look into his past uh, when he was down south, and I think it was Memphis, see if there's any missing children uh, from everywhere he went, and just basically take a real hard look at this guy and what, what his past is like, and see if we can make any connection to any other potential missing persons or homicides, because murdering and dismembering a small child doesn't seem like, you know, something you do just out of the blue. I mean, everybody that's a serial killer has their first one. What do we do now to try to, to find out? They get the cadaver dogs inside. There's 21 rooms in this, in this home, and we want to find out are there any other victims within it or any other body parts that we missed. Yeah, this house also had rooms within rooms. There was uh, like doorways. You didn't even know it was a doorway. And when you opened it, it actually went into another room, like a hidden room area. It's very complex. Yeah, as if you needed to make it any more creepy than it already was. It had all the makings of a horror, horror movie. It really did. It was like the house of horrors. So when a cadaver dog goes inside, it starts at the first floor. The cadaver dog now goes back into this one room. It's by the bathroom. And it hits on a scent in the wall on the first floor. And the dog is in motions as if there's something in that wall. So we get an issue there. And our heart kind of drops and we're like, oh no, not another victim. And they open up an area of the wall. It's about five by four hole they make in a wall. And they look in there and they don't find anything, thank God. They don't find another victim. They don't find any body parts. There's a lot of pieces of evidence in there. It looks like there's blood on a lot of different items. I don't know if he was dressing this little boy in somebody's clothing that he collected. You have a lot in different rooms of this house that we have to process to identify. Does it come back to this boy or does it come back to another victim? Like Bill was saying, once the dog finished up inside the house, uh, we brought the dog outside. 
we have uh, what's called T probes, where we probe the ground to release uh, air scents. If there's any bodies that were buried in the backyard, the air scents would come out of those holes and the dog would be able to hit on it. In addition to that, the forensic anthropologists are able to look at the, the grass, or whatever weeds are growing out of the ground to determine if a human body was buried there at one point. Uh, the human body acts as fertilizer and certain weeds grow if human fertilization was used in that soil. They're able to figure out um, scientifically if a body was there by the grass and the weeds, and also through the dogs um, by probing the ground and letting the air come out of the ground. And uh, we, we 100% confidently felt that there was nobody ever buried in that backyard. I've had some experience with that and uh, with the anthropologist and their methods in the past and, you know, using the T-probe. The T-probe is basically a T-shaped rod that you'll push into the ground. And, and what you're looking for is to see, you know, the soil consistency. Is it compacted? Is it hard? Is it soft? And, and looking to feel around for some voids where a body may have been taking up the space but then shrunk due to uh, decomposition. In my experience, all of that stuff is great and it's helpful, but it's not foolproof because, because I've seen it go both ways. I've seen it miss bodies that were actually there and later recovered. And I've also seen it recover bodies where you wouldn't think there was. So it's not foolproof, but it's one of the things you could do to try to discover what's there and what isn't. I mean, you can't just go in there haphazardly. All the forensic people get together and they say that that probe is probably the best way to go about doing it without disturbing the evidence that's there that, that may have been there for years that's very fragile. And then when you go down, again, you're not using a backhoe. You'd go in with shovels and rakes and you methodically go and dig and try to recover whatever bones you can. Many times you're not finding a whole body. You're finding maybe pieces of the body, bones of the body. You don't know. There's animals that could have gotten to it and eaten some of the, the body remains. It's a very difficult job. You have to do it methodically. And the people that we had on the scene for this job, the forensic anthropologist, who's phenomenal, and also the crime scene detectives, I give them a lot of credit because they took their time and they said, what do we have? What's the best way to go forward to recover any remains that may be in this yard? To set the scene, it kind of looks like to me, like an archaeological dig is going on. Usually they'll set up a grid with strings. They'll mark any areas that they find are suspicious and need further looking into. And uh, once you think there might be something there and they start digging a little, you'll actually see members of the OCME with, uh, you know, shaker screens like you would see in a geological dig, shaking through things to find small bits of bone, ballistics evidence, you know, anything that could be of uh, probative value. And uh, it actually looks like an archaeological dig when, when you're looking at it. That's exactly what they did. Uh, we set up ropes in a grid formation. That's basically depends on how big the area is, is how big you're going to make the grid. And it's a, really a twofold purpose. One is to make consistency in your digging. So you, you know what area you already uh, processed because sometimes it's not apparent. You're not digging it all up. You're just probing. And it's also for documentation purposes. When you present in a court later on, you actually have to present the exact uh, zone or grid, grid area that you found it in. Exactly. You want to preserve that evidence, anything that you find for the prosecution. This whole investigation went on for weeks. It was a never-ending investigation. It went on for 12 hours a day for about four weeks. When the perpetrator was brought down to the 6-6 precinct, uh, he was read his rights. Uh, the, he was interviewed, and, and he gave a confession. And he he told investigators everything that happened from start to finish. The investigators were on point. He meets the boy on that corner that day. He brings them upstate. They attend the wedding. He leaves the boy in the car. He only stays at the wedding forty five minutes because he he knows he's got the boy in the car. He stops at the gas station on the way home at the, on the Palisades Parkway. He brings the boy into his apartment. Um, he hangs out with the boy all day. Goes to dinner at his parents' house, comes back, and then the next day, and that's Tuesday, so he smothers him on Tuesday night between 5 and 7 at night. Uh, he confesses to drugging the little boy with four different types of uh, prescription medicine. He's giving him these muscle relaxants, the antipsychotic pills and the pain relievers, along with the wine. Yeah, there was a, uh, a sexual angle to this. Uh, even though there was no 
evidence that the boy was sexually assaulted. Uh, the autopsy did not reveal any type of sexual assault on the boy, but there was a sexual angle to it. Uh, once the boy is intoxicated with uh, the prescription medicine, he confesses to smothering the boy with the towel. Uh, and then out of a panic to get rid of him, he, he dismembers him on a mattress, on a, a crib sized mattress in that apartment with those, those three large chef knives, packages them up in the bags, and then brings them out to 20th Street, uh, dumps the, the, the luggage with the torso in the dumpster and, uh, and that other bag with some body parts. And he kept the feet in the freezer. Now, there's, uh, there's some belief that he was going to keep the feet. He probably realizes at this point that the body is going to start to smell and he may be discovered. So, you know, while he's doing all those things, he goes downstairs to his parents' apartment for dinner. He comes back. He's probably thinking of, you know, how do I get rid of this? So I'm not, dis it's not discovered here. And that's probably where he ends up doing the dismemberment, putting it in the luggage and taking it out to uh, 20th Street and 4th Avenue in the dumpster where he, he figures it'll never be uh, tracked back to him. But it's really odd that he kept the feet and he told us so much about what happened, but he wouldn't tell us why he kept those feet. He keeps the feet? As a memento. Yeah, a lot, of, a lot of killers do that. You know, we never mentioned it, but we know the kid was murdered. We know he was dismembered. Did we ever find out the actual cause of death? So toxicology results come back about six to eight weeks after the autopsy is done. And toxicology revealed there was uh, four main prescription medicines in his body. There was muscle relaxants. There was pain relievers. There was uh, uh, Xanax. Uh, there's hydrocodone, and the cause and manner of death was acute intoxication by smothering. He drugged him when he was in a, a stupor, in a drunken stupor state. Uh, he smothered him with a towel, and um, it was confirmed scientifically and by his confession. The pathologist also noted that whoever cut up the body, they were unskilled at doing it. I mean, I'm not talking about him being a professional butcher. But he was unskilled in that he left a lot of tool marks on the bone. He didn't cut the legs at the joints. Yeah, a lot of people think you found the kid. He's He's been murdered. You found you have your suspect. He's been arrested. Like the shows you see on TV, story over. Nah, that's, what, that's, that's when a, a lot of the hard part of this job begins for those detectives. You have to process everything at that crime scene. You have to look into his background and look for other victims. Uh, you have to prepare the case for a prosecution with the DA. So when Chris says, you know, this was a, a, a job that went on for 12 hours a day for another four weeks, that's the part you don't see on TV. You know, it's not over when you put the handcuffs on the bad guy. That's where the real work begins. So how did the prosecution go in this case? The perpetrator confessed and pled guilty to this horrific crime. And he's serving 40 years to life in prison. And he's still in jail to this day. As the years went on, this family, this house, was really no stranger to more tragedy. A few years later, they found the perpetrator's brother tied up in the basement, in the closet, dead. Chris, I remember that case with the brother, and that was, you'd think uh, this was a strange case. Just add some more strangeness to it. The brother was found inside a closet in the basement, uh, wrapped up with comforters and duct tape, bent over a chair that was inside of the closet. And to this day, we haven't been able to determine a cause of death. There was no obvious cause of death, no trauma to the body. And uh, the medical examiner, after doing an autopsy, basically said uh, cause is undetermined. So we don't know if it was positional asphyxiation or if the guy did it on purpose, but the brother, too, was very mentally unstable. And unfortunately, he was found dead in, that, in the basement of that house also. Reflecting back on this, I can't help but remember that first day that I was assigned to Borough Park on that Friday night, and that gentleman came over to me asking for help, and I went into his house and looking at his little kids. And I'm standing outside this home now, 30 years later, looking at the media, looking at the crowd gathered to see are there any other victims coming out of this home. And I can't help but think about those children 
that came over to me that day, 30 years earlier. They were so trustworthy. They were so inquisitive. 30 years later, and you look at this little boy, this eight-year-old boy is now dead. And you just wonder, could things have been different if maybe this killer would have gotten mental health treatment? There's a silver lining to this terrible story that we're starting to wrap up here. And the silver lining is, after the disappearance of this, this boy and subsequently his murder, people in the community and local politicians and even law enforcement all got together and said, what can we do better here so this doesn't happen again or so we can find these missing kids quicker? And a lot of money was put into putting uh, cameras up in public spaces in that neighborhood. So the legacy is not just the tragedy here. The legacy of this poor young kid is that that neighborhood actually became safer because of his death. And it shows in times of crisis, that community really came together for the victim's family. You look at the importance they place on child safety now, and everyone being the eyes and ears of that community. The community came together for this victim's family. They provided comfort and support in a time of need. This case will always stick with me. This is a case that anything that could happen will happen. And um, you know, I think it taught us all that expect the unexpected. A little boy, dismemberment, kidnapping drugging, sexual angle to it. So anything that could happen in life will happen. I think this prepared us for future and our careers going down this road that we were able to see some of the messed up things that New York City had to offer and been able to deal with it, deal with it professionally. Because there's a family there, there's a boy's mother, there's a boy's father. And to this day, they're probably saying, what if I just waited on a different corner? What if I did this? What if I did that? Why did I let him walk home alone? We tend to forget that there's a mom, there's a dad, uh, and, and they're still living with it to this day. But we stay focused. It was a, a four-week-long crime scene investigation, very professional. It built a better investigator inside of you. I want to recognize the investigators, the forensic professionals that work day and night to try to find this boy alive and the person who abducted and killed him. And the Hasidic community, the Shamrim, they were there every step of the way and you know, it's just a, a really tragic incident, but it brought together the community, it brought together law enforcement, it brought together the forensic community to make sure that uh, this doesn't happen again. Bill, I'll add something to that. And you've heard me say it time and time again. That gold detective shield really is something special. And so are the men and women who wear it. And that's that. You can find Real Crime NYC on Spotify, Apple, Facebook, or wherever you get your podcast. Please hit subscribe or follow for free access to the most up-to-date episodes of Real Crime NYC. I'm Pat. I'm Chris. And I'm Bill. We'll see you when we see you.